Hello, everybody. Uh, apologies for the delays. Uh, so we are now about to start. We have shared the YouTube live streaming link on the chat box. So please do well to share with your colleagues. So right about now, we will be inviting the facilitator for today. So before that, this webinar is brought to us by the African Community for Systematic Reviews and Meta-Analysis, ACSRM, and author aid. ACSRM is a research capacity leading organization, and our focus or interest is in training researchers on how to conduct systematic reviews and to train policymakers on how to use systematic reviews. So author aid supports uh, the ACSRM project. Authorhead is uh, a global community of researchers, and Authorhead organizes capacity building uh, webinars, events, and workshops, essentially on the basics of research writing and on grants writing. So towards uh, the end of the webinar, we'll be sharing links to all our platforms, uh, to our ACSRM platforms and Authorhead platforms. And then there are also some announcements we'll be giving towards uh, the end of the event, because like we said, this is a certificate program and we'd like to guide you on how you will obtain your certificate for this webinar service. All right, so the facilitator for today is Dr. Ekwere One Esu. Dr. Esu is a public health specialist with a particular focus on epidemiology, clinical trials, survey methods, and project evaluation. He has background in biological sciences and holds a Master's of Science in Public Health and PhD in International Health. He's a senior lecturer at the University of Calabar and is involved in systematic reviews of maternal and child health interventions. Dr. Su is a field epidemiologist of Kosovo Health and Demographic Surveillance System and is affiliated with Cochrane Nigeria. So towards the end of the webinar, we'll be sharing, uh, I believe Dr. Su will be sharing his email uh, and maybe links to social media platforms in, in case you'd want to follow him. So Dr. Su, this is time for you. The floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Fortune, and um, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's joined. So today I will continue from where we left off last week. So last week, we looked at um, selecting studies. And so the next step after you have selected studies would then be to go on to do data extraction. So like Fortune said, I, I work at the Department of Public Health in the University of Calabar, and I'm also a member of the International Society for Evidence-Based Healthcare. And uh, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So here is an outline of the presentation. We'll look at what data extraction is, uh, the sort of data we actually collect, and what we need to be looking out for as regards collecting outcome data. We'll would also uh, discuss scenarios where you have multiple um, data formats and how you handle this. And I'll show you some author support tools and the things you should include in your data extraction forms. And we would look at the steps you could take to minimize bias in data extraction. As you may know, um, the hallmark of systematic reviews is the ability to minimize um, bias in every step of the way. And this is what makes them uh, distinct from other types of reviews like narrative reviews and scoping reviews. It's this ability to, to minimize bias. Uh, lastly, I'll show you a few screenshots from uh, a review which should be simple enough for everyone to relate to. So what is data extraction? Data extraction involves systematically collecting relevant information from selected studies to address the research questions or objectives of the systematic review. 
So you'll notice I have highlighted relevant information and selected uh, studies. And this is to emphasize the fact that you do not need to extract data for every study, only the ones which uh, have been selected. So the ones which based on your eligibility inclusion in the systematic review. You also need to note that um, for the review, what to extract would be guided by the scope of the review, the, the objectives of the review, and your eligibility criteria, which would usually be captured in your PICO framework, which you would have carefully thought through when you were defining your question. So as a way of recap, these are the steps to conducting a review. So by the time you are doing data extraction, you have gone up to stage uh, step number six. So you have concluded your selection of studies and you're now ready to tease out the required information from the included studies. So like I said, after you selected the studies to be included in your review, you then need to collect the data from them. But then why is it important to do data extraction? There are a couple of reasons. The first is that that's the only way we're able to summarize the studies in a common format that allows us to facilitate synthesis and presents the data in a lucid manner. It's also a necessary step for us to be able to identify the numerical data which we would require for our meta-analysis. And this would be means, counts, or rates of the outcomes of interest. Again, without the data extraction, we would not be able to perform a critical appraisal of the quality of the included studies. So as part of the data extraction, we would obtain information that allows us to assess more objectively the risk of bias and the applicability of the studies that we have found. And then lastly, uh, to, uh, allows us to identify information that could be missing or incorrectly assessed data. It's also useful for highlighting outcomes that are often not reported and where there are cases of underrepresented populations. So this uh, data extraction process helps to highlight uh, inequities that might exist, particularly in health. So regarding data extraction, uh, you should aim to accurately reflect the information that's reported by the authors of the primary uh, studies, because for a systematic review, we are engaging in, in secondary research. So we are relying on the data provided to us by the authors of primary studies. We should also strive to remain as close as possible to the original reports, and this allows for easy resolution of disputes. So you don't want to say uh, you saw something in a study which you didn't actually see. So in the course of doing data extraction, you must strive to remain as close as possible to the original reporting. The data extraction also should provide sufficient information to allow an understanding of the studies and for us to be able to perform the analysis. Again, you should only extract only the data that's needed because uh, data extraction is a labor intensive uh, process and it's also time consuming. So you don't want to be collecting data that you ultimately will not need. Again, different research questions may have different data needs. So you, you need to tailor your data extraction according to the scope uh, and, uh, and the depth of your research questions. So, so for some reviews, it's a, a narrow question. For others, there are, there's a broad question and there are some sub 
uh, objectives within the question. So the data extraction needs for such a complex review would obviously be more rigorous than those for a narrow question. So data extraction would require a familiarity with the content and the knowledge of epidemiological principles and statistical concepts. And this is particularly important because the, the data may not always be reported in the form that we would expect. So you might be required to do some conversions. And so it helps if you are well grounded in your epidemiology and statistics. And this is why systematic review teams could, should be multidisciplinary because in that way you can draw on the strengths of others. So even if you don't have competencies in one area, you can always leverage on other team members to, to get those aspects of the work done. So what are the sources of data for, for our data extraction? This could come from journal articles, that would usually be the primary source, but it could also come from conference abstracts. And these are a very uh, important way of including unpublished um, data in our, in our reviews. Another place to look would be errata and letters written to editors, because for, for many studies, this is how you are able to uh, identify errors that may have been made to the results or flaws in the conduct of studies which may have been pointed out by other researchers. You should also consult trial registers, especially if you are including uh, randomized control trials in your review as the study design of choice, because this would allow you to identify trials that may have just concluded or may be ongoing at the time when you're undertaking your systematic review. Regulatory reviews are also an important source of data, particularly for reviews around um, pharmacology, um, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And uh, this would be available on the sites of uh, the FDA, uh, for Nigeria, NAFDAQ, and in Europe, the um, European Medicines Agency, AMA. You could also rely on individual patient data, and this would need to be sourced from the authors of um, those studies. A backup plan is to contact the authors of the studies where you are not clear about some information that may have been presented in the published articles, or where you need to be certain about what um, outcomes were reported. Because of uh, space limits, award limits in journals, many times the authors are not able to publish all of the data. So they try to prioritize and uh, there might be some data which is not in the published article, but you may be able to access this if you contacted the authors. So now that we've discussed the importance of um, data extraction and the sources, we look at what data we collect when we do data extraction. So you will need to collect a wide range of information about each study, and this would be everything you would want to report and analyze in your review and everything your readers would want to know about your included studies. So you need to be meticulous and comprehensive when you do your data extraction. So primarily, we would need to collect information on the population or the patients of interest for the question, the setting, the intervention, and this would also include what these interventions were compared to, so the comparison. So you would need to consider those factors and variations in the population and intervention that you think might have an impact on the results of the study. 
and that you specified in your protocol that you would investigate. So usually in your systematic review protocol, you would have identified some variables for which you would undertake subgroup analysis. So if you do not collect data on these when you're doing data extraction, you won't have that information available to use when it's time to perform your subgroup analysis. More importantly for your audience, the readers would want enough information to allow them to decide whether they can apply the results from your review to their own context or setting. Also, the information we collect at this stage would also feed into sections of our systematic review. So, First, we will primarily be required to state the references for the studies we have included. We would also need to describe all of the included studies in a tab table that shows the characteristics of included studies. This usually would be table one in, in the results section of your systematic review. We would also need it to complete the risk of bias assessment. And uh, also for our meta-analysis, and for the grade assessment, which tries to put a measure to the certainty of the evidence. So how confident are we in the evidence that we found? So this slide shows um, the different things to think about. It's by no way an exhaustive list, but it's a good guide and a way to approach designing your data extraction forms. So you, you should start off with information about the paper, the background, the, the authors, the reference. And it's good practice to always include a study ID that helps you track publications. And then you would go on to confirm the eligibility criteria. So you would look at the participants, the intervention, the comparison, the outcomes to be sure that they fit with the eligibility criteria for your review. And um, you will then go on to extract information on the methods they have used, the participants, the interventions, and the outcomes. So we would look at collected outcome data. So in some cases, uh, different studies would report uh, data in different formats, making it difficult for us to combine the studies. So what then are our options when this is the case? So first, we can choose the most commonly reported measure. So if we have 20 included studies and up to 15 present data for a particular outcome, for instance, using means and standard deviations, and the others use, uh, counted the number of participants in each group that had the outcome of interest. It would make sense to use uh, the measure for which up to 15 studies have reported. So we would include those 15 in the meta-analysis and probably include the rest in additional tables. We could also do some conversion of results into to make the data more usable. So we could do conversion of the results into more usable formats. So for some publications, we might be looking out for mean and standard deviation, but the authors may report the mean and uh, the standard error of the mean or a, a confidence interval. And then there are statistical calculators we could use to derive the standard deviation from the information provided. So in some circumstances, you'll be required to do conversions of results to make them more amenable to meta-analysis. Our third option is to, is to contact the study authors for additional information where we are not able to, to um, decide on a commonly reported measure or it's not possible based on the information provided to do a conversion of the results.
So next we would discuss how you design your data extraction form and we'll look at some author support tools that help you along the way when you do data extraction. So because your data collection is very critical to the reporting of the review, your data collection form should help you organize the collection of all the relevant information. And so in, in that regard, it helps you uh, be reminded of, of what you need to collect. It also helps to clarify what was not reported in the studies. And it, it also serves as a, a reminder of the decisions that you have made about each study and also serves as a source document for, for data entry. So after you've completed um, data extraction, you would then impute that data into your meta-analysis, which will be done with software. So it serves as a source document for, for that step. Your data collection forms need to be adapted and tailored to your review. And so there is no one correct data extraction form template. So you would always need to adapt it to your, to your own review question. And this could be paper form or could be electronic, uh, where you have authors working across um, uh, different uh, geographical uh, areas. It's usually better to do electronic uh, data extraction because then it's easier to compare notes. You could put the file in a shared drive or exchange emails as opposed to paper version of data extraction. But if you are in a setting where um, electricity might be a challenge or where you will be disconnected from internet for a long period of time, you may at that moment have no option than to use paper. So at the barest minimum, our data collection forms should include a re the review title, the name of the review author who is completing the form, and the study ID. And in instances where there are multiple publications of the same study, it's useful to also have a record ID in addition to the study ID. You should also allow plenty of space for additional notes and ensure that you begin with the eligibility criteria at the beginning of the form so you don't go ahead to extract data for a study which gets excluded at the end of the day. It usually helps to make a note of the source of each piece of information. So it might help to write the page number or the section of the publication where the information came from, because it's not always the case that all the information you need would come from the results section. Sometimes it's uh, hidden in one line in the discussion. And so if you went back a few months after to look in the results section, you might not find it because the information came from one line in the discussion section. So it usually helps to make a note of the page number or the section where the information has been obtained. As much as possible, try to use um, tick boxes or coded options to save time. And this is useful whether you're doing paper or electronic data extraction. So for electronic data extraction, it could be a simple Excel sheet with um, drop-down menus. You could also use macros to ultimately make decisions about which studies should be included and excluded. So there is great latitude to, to do as much as you're able to do based on your level of competency with spreadsheets. Again, you should make a distinction in your data extraction forms between information that is not reported and uh, information that is unclear. Because if you don't make this distinction, when we see a blank space in our data extraction form, 
maybe six weeks after we looked at the paper, we are now able to decide whether we omitted to extract the information or whether the study reported it in a manner that was not clear, and so we didn't know what to extract. Or if indeed it was unclear or not reported. So it's good to make the distinction between uh, information that is not reported and information that is unclear. One way is to have a convention in amongst the review authors doing extraction on how you would write information that is not reported and how you would express when it is unclear. Like we do with data extraction, you could use codes. So if you agree that whenever information was not reported, you would write 99. And if we see 99 entered for a particular field, we know that it was not reported, as opposed to us forgetting to extract the information. So next, we'll look at how we minimize bias in the data extraction. Earlier, I said that the hallmark of systematic reviews is that at every step of the way, there are deliberate steps taken to minimize the introduction of bias. And so this also applies to data extraction. So best practices for data extraction will be to have at least two authors independently collect study characteristics and outcome data and then compare notes. So this helps with reducing errors. And it also allows for us to make checks of agreements, particularly for judgments and interpretations which are subjective. It's also useful for resolving. So we also need to set up a mechanism for resolving disagreements. And this could be by recourse to a third author, or by discussion between both authors who have um, completed the data extraction. It's also useful to train reviewers and pilot the data collection from on a few studies before you go on to extract data from all studies. In this way, you can have a sense of how well the form works and be sure that everyone collecting the data is on the same page as to what information is required for every field. And usually, after this pilot, there will be need to, to revise the form or the instructions for completing it as, as will be the case for any questionnaire. Again, it's, it's proper to contact study authors to obtain unreported data or to clarify unclear data. And the strength of this is that it helps to guard against um, selective reporting. So in the published work, there seems to be undue pressure to only publish positive results. And so with efforts to contact authors in this way, if there are results which have been left out because they were not positive, then it helps to give a balanced picture on all of the data that's available for a particular outcome or condition. So with regards to support tools for conducting data extraction, I've put a couple, there's um, distiller, which uh, allows you even do um, screening. So most of them are, are useful from when you screen uh, studies up to even data extraction. So there's Distiller, there is Covidence, there's the JBI summary, there's Ryan, and there's Epi Reviewer, which is useful for complex reviews and qualitative reviews. Uh, the beauty of most of these tools is that they now incorporate um, artificial intelligence, which helps to reduce the burden of work, particularly for uh, screening studies to decide which ones are, are in and which ones are out. So you can set up keywords that um, the software would use to eliminate studies. So it, it would 
segregate the studies into the ones you, you, you should read and the ones you don't need to read. So in that way, you're able to save time. And uh, they also allow you to do data extraction independently and also resolve um, conflicts within the software. So again, this would be the way to go, particularly for large teams who are not located in the same place. Again, it, it helps to, to ensure that there is always a copy of the review that is safe so that if one person's laptop crashes, it doesn't mean that all of the effort is gone. So we've talked a lot about the principles and the reasons for doing data extraction. In the remaining minutes of the presentation, I would just walk you through how this actually happens in, in practice. So to do this, I've selected a review which will start to interventions for preventing obesity in children. It was published in 2019. And for this review, the eligibility criteria was um, study design, randomized control trials. The interventions of interest were diet or physical activity interventions, set alone or combined. So for this review, they were interested in all randomized control trials that had study diet alone, physical activity alone, or a combination of diet and physical activity all aimed at preventing overweight or obesity in children. And this review specified that they would only include studies where these outcomes had been reported for a minimum of 12 weeks from baseline. Because in their judgments, this is the shortest time frame where they would see um, appreciable changes. So again, just to list out the criteria. So the population will be children. These are the interventions. And in terms of comparison, they compare this to no treatment or usual care or another active intervention. And these are the outcomes of interest. So here is a screenshot of the trial. And then um, On the left, you have a screenshot of the characteristics of the included studies from the review. And on the right, I have highlighted um, portions of the full text where this information has come from. So the study design is RCT, and you will see that this is clearly stated in the design section of the methods for the full text. They also reported um, the inclusion criteria. The unit of analysis was individuals. Unit of allocation was also individuals. So here we see, in terms of recruitment, it included children between the 50th percentile and the 95th percentile BMI. And children were recruited primarily on the radio station whose listening audience included parents in the targeted age groups from ethnic communities in, in the US. So all of the information that we ultimately report comes from the full text. So we don't make things up when we do data extraction. We report what we have found. And remember earlier I said, as much as possible, we should stay as close as possible to the original information um, that was published by the authors of the primary studies. So here you will see age in years. In the review, it says uh, the mean age was uh, 10 to 20 respondents were 10 years, see 42.5 comes from the, the primary study, same thing with 32.7 and 24.8%. Um, so it, it's a painstaking process and we, 
we need to be sure that we do not represent misrepresent the information which we have um, relied upon to in the conduct of our systematic review. So all of the information and the details of how the interventions were, were conducted are all drawn from the full text articles. And so there is no, there's no shortcut to doing data extraction. You, you have to be focused, you have to be deliberate so that at the end of the day, people can rely on your reporting to be a true reflection of what is contained in the primary studies out there. So we also increasingly would want to know about um, who funded the study, as this could have implications for the reporting of the findings. So it's good practice to also always extract information on funding and conflicts of interest amongst the authors. So we also said that the data extraction gives us an opportunity to also collect information that allows us to complete a risk of bias assessment, which tells us the quality of the conduct of, of the studies. So here for the risk of bias assessment under the blinding domain, the review authors have judged it as low risk and the support for their judgment is that um, for anthropometric assessment and their 24 hour dietary recalls, data collectors were blinded to group assignments. And this information comes straight from the full text of the, of the primary study. So in your risk of bias assessment, for every judgment you make, you need to provide the support for the judgment. And this could be an explanation or a direct quote from the full text of the included studies. So as I wrap up, as regards um, data, what are we expected to report in your protocol? At the barest minimum, your protocol should state the data categories that will be collected. Also, whether two authors will independently extract data. If you will do a piloting of the data extraction form, how discrepancies and disagreements will be managed and what processes you would institute to manage missing data. So if you plan to con contact um, study authors for additional information, you would also need to state that in your protocol. So in summary, as you think about um, data extraction, you, sh you should remember that you need to think critically and consider what data would be necessary to extract. You should also make efforts to design and then pilot your data collection form before you go into full data extraction. And you should strive to minimize error and bias. And at the barest minimum, we said data extraction should be done independently by at least two people. So for large reviews where there are several included studies, you could authors could work in pairs to do data extraction. In this way, we would keep um, errors to the barest minimum and also be able to do a check on subjective judgments. So I end with a quote, quote which says, you can have data without information, but you cannot have information without data. So the quality of the information you get from your systematic review is dependent on how you go about your data extraction. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. For further guidance, I will refer you to chapter five, which is um, collecting data in the Cochrane Handbook for systematic reviews, which is available online. 
So over to thank you very much, Dr. Russell. You're welcome. Uh, thank you very much for this insightful session. Uh, for now, we can start uh, the question uh, part. If you have any question, you can raise up your hand. But I will start with uh, some questions that have been shared in Q&A section as well as YouTube. So the first question in YouTube is that, how can we access extraction tools? Okay, so um, many of those extraction tools I shared require you to pay, but uh, many of them also have free trial versions, which give you limited functionality. So like with any commercial software, the, the free trials will not be allow you to do as much as, as the full versions. So you can buy. But don't forget that you could also uh, do a lot with, with Excel. So if you already have a PC that runs on Microsoft or OS, you can always use your spreadsheet to achieve a lot. The advantage of the software you pay for is that increasingly they incorporate AI, which helps to speed up the process. And it also ensures that all of your data is always safe in the cloud. And it's easy for everyone to, to look at at the same time. Uh, thank you. The next question is, um, what is the difference between a meta-analysis and systematic review? I think this question had been asked in the previous session, but... Uh, okay, so maybe you can... simply put your... Your meta-analysis is an optional part of a systematic review. So if you go through all of the steps and ensure that you have minimized bias at every step of the way, if you find that the studies have not reported information in a way that is similar enough to combine them, then you would end up doing a narrative. So you would have a systematic review without a meta-analysis. So the meta-analysis is a quantitative synthesis of results. So in a systematic review, you can have, you would always have a narrative synthesis. And if the studies report data in a similar enough manner, then you can also do a quantitative um, synthesis. So it's possible Thank to you. have meta-analysis as standalone, and you could also have systematic reviews which do not include meta-analysis. Uh, all right, uh, I think the next question will go to uh, Chaneli. Uh, you are raising your hand, I will ask you to unmute, so you can go ahead and ask your question. Thank you so much. Sorry. Um, yes, my name is Chanel Muloko, and I'm a postdoc at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. So my question is, um, I just wanted to clarify this point. Like you said that data extraction should be done in 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 what's um independently by two people. So are you saying that the two people have to do exactly the same? Uh, extract data from the same papers. Let's say I'm extracting data with Samuel, right? And there's 10 articles. So I have to do all the 10 articles and he also has to do all the 10 articles and then we compare. Is that what you mean? Yes. Or we can just yes. do five, five? Okay, all right. No, so you do 10, 10. But another way around it is to have another pair of, of uh, authors who cross-check. So if you have four, then you can do five, five. Each pair will do five. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Welcome. All right. Uh, let's go to the next question, which is uh, How would you approach designing a scalable and robust data extraction system capable of handling real time streaming data? Sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, real-time uh, real streaming data with varying uh, formats and structures ensuring high accuracy 
uh, low latency and adaptability to involving data sources. Should I repeat the question? Well, it sounds like an AI question. <laughs> I don't know. I think the simple answer would be, uh, I don't know enough uh, of computer science and artificial intelligence to answer that question. But um, like I said, most of the author support tools are shared are already incorporating artificial intelligence to help make the process easier. Uh, all right, next question. Uh, some studies report studies of SLR and thematic analysis of literature. Are the two techniques same? So you said S, S what? I missed that part. S, so some studies S, report. SLR and thematic analysis. So I'm not sure what the what the SLR means, but um, yeah, there are different variants uh, in used in in the published literature to de to describe um, different types of reviews. So you have scoping reviews, you have rapid reviews, you have uh, thematic gap analysis. But usually, the key is to is to look in the objective and see what what the author set out to do. You would also see increasingly now uh, a new type of review called uh, living systematic reviews. So this would be more dynamic reviews where the evidence gets updated as soon as new studies become available. But with regards to the core steps, they are all very similar. You would always start off with asking an unanswerable question and then you go on to search the literature and then you apply your eligibility criteria and for, for, for most review types you then do a an appraisal of the risk of bias and then do a synthesis of, of the findings but they vary in, in terms of the objective so some reviews try to highlight gaps to inform further research others try to gather evidence to either support practice or change practice. All right, I think SLR, it's a abbreviation of systematic literature review. So you already provide the answer. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, so you systematic mm -hmm. literature review and systematic review used interchangeably. But mm -hmm. uh, we should always be critical and look in the methods. So I rely more on reading the methods and deciding what the authors did than relying on what they have said they did in the title. So. Okay, thank you. Shall we go to the next question? Uh, someone is raising his or her hand. I'm sorry, maybe I will. I just ask you to unmute. You can ask your question. Sorry, I cannot pronounce your name. Okay, Good evening, everybody. My name is Tukemeka Mwachuya. I'm a pharmacist from Nigeria. And I have a very brief question. Thank you very much for the presentation. So my question is, um, I know systematic review um, and meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is an extension of systematic review. But prior to conducting the study, do you know if you, you're going to perform a meta-analysis? And if you will know, what um, details will you need to get while conducting the data extraction, extraction process? I don't know if you understood the question. Yeah, so, so usually you wouldn't know. So when we set out to do a systematic review, <laughs> we are doing it with an open mind, but we plan for whatever scenario. So in your even in your protocol, you would say that you will do a systematic review. And if the studies are similar enough, you would combine them. So that way, if you don't do the meta-analysis, it would be implied that the studies were not similar enough. With regards to what you need to plan to do, there's not, whether you're able to do a systematic review or not, it doesn't really um, have much, uh, 
implication as far as planning for the review is concerned. If the data is reported, ideally for a meta-analysis for dichotomous data, we would need to know the number of participants in both groups and also the number of people who had the outcome of interest in both groups. And then for continuous outcomes, we would look for look out for the mean standard deviation and the number of participants in each arm. So in the intervention group and in the comparison group. So if it is there and you have enough several studies reporting the data in the same format, then you can include it in the meta-analysis. Otherwise, you would just do a qualitative um, synthesis and report the information either as text or in tables. Uh, thank you. There is a question uh, in YouTube, which is, can one develop or adapt an extraction tool? Is validation done for developed tool like in primary study? Okay, so uh, like I'm not I sure said, what does it develop, okay. Okay, like I said, for with regards to your data collection forms, they have to be adapted for, for each review. So there is guidance on, on some basics which should be in every uh, data extraction tool. And I shared some of those in, in the presentation. But the remaining details will be dependent on what the focus of the systematic review is. So it's not the case that we would rely on a particular tool and say it had been validated by so so, -so number of of people or it has a CAPA score of so, 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 and so. We don't do that for, for systematic review data extraction forms. Okay, uh, the opportunity for Lucas, you can, you raise your hand, you can go up. Unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, thank you very much for this presentation. My question actually is on screening, like when using the PICO formats during screening. I want to know if when reviewing your papers and you find out that the paper meets three of the criteria, like your population that you're interested in, also the intervention of interest, and also the comparison, but it fails to capture the outcome. Are you going to include that paper during your screening or you leave it because of that one criterion. So in most cases, you would include it whether or not it included the outcomes of interest. Remember that when the primary, when the authors of the primary studies were, they were doing their, their study protocol, they didn't know that you would come along one day and do a systematic review. So we generally do not exclude studies because they didn't report outcomes of interest to us. So we would include it and state that for this particular study, although we included it, we didn't find any um, outcomes that were relevant for our own review. The other reason why you shouldn't exclude them is because like I said, due to uh, word limits, they may have actually collected information on that outcome but did not report it. So if you contact the, the authors, they may be able to provide the, out, the outcome results, even though they were not in the published uh, article. But again, in some situations, you are interested in an intervention for a particular outcome. So the common example is pain. So a particular formulation may be used for other things, it could be for fever, but you are interested in that formulation for pain. So in that scenario, any study that is not assessing the effectiveness of that intervention for pain would be excluded. So again, your, your objectives and your PICO framework would usually tell you which direction to go. All right, thank you very much. Well, uh, welcome, Tom. You can go ahead. Uh, 
Tom, you raise your hand. Are you here? All right. I thank the presenter for sharing his thoughts with us as far as systematic review is concerned. Uh, the, the, the session is quite a brief one. And I will plead humbly that he shares the presentation slides with us so that we could acquaint ourselves to almost all the vital ingredients that every data extraction procedure should entail. In addition, I want a few clarifications. The first one has to do with the criteria that he gave for extracting the data. Uh, the, is it exclusive? Or if you can you can expand your tentacles and include other vital issues that you, the reviewer, want to put to your readers. Second one, I missed the first session. So again, I'm appealing to him humbly if I can get the slide presentations to the first session so that I can follow accordingly. Thank you. Okay, so the criteria we, I talked about, I said uh, the barest minimum. So it is in no way restricted. Like I said, uh, the data extraction form should be adapted along the lines of the, the objectives and scope of the systematic review. So whatever you think readers would want to know about included studies or you think would be necessary to do your meta-analysis, including your subgroup and sensitivity analysis, of course, by all means, you should include that in your form so that you can extract that information because the tendency is to not extract it if you have not been intentional to include it as one of the items to extract in your data extraction form. As regards the slides, sure, we'll make them available. So the first session you're, you're talking about, is that the one from last week? The one you missed? Yes, please, the one for last week. Okay. So I'm sure we can make that available to you, but it's also on YouTube. I'm sure the, the host could point you to, to the link. I watched the one for last week on YouTube on Saturday morning. Wow. Wow. I'll be I'll be very grateful, sir. Uh thank you very much, Sean, for your question. That was the last question. Since we have limited time, I'll invite uh, 14 now to the stage. Please uh, you type your question. Sorry, Percy. Uh, I will share a link and we have a form you can type your question and we can find time to discuss it later. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Nafisa. Thank you very much, Dr. Su. Uh, before we get the final words from Dr. Su, I'd like to mention that, uh, yes, Nafisa will be sharing a form, and that form is like a question box because we cannot exhaust all the questions in one webinar. So we usually push some of the questions into a question box, and we try to trade these questions later uh, because we have an event that is called Ask the Experts Session. So in the Ask the Expert session, what we do is to um, give answers, provide insight to some of the questions we have been asking before and the ones that we'll ask uh, in the event. So we'll be sharing the link. We're sharing a link for you to join the, for you to register for the Ask the Expert session very soon through our email. And then uh, I don't know if Dr. Su could share his, okay, his email address is already there. Uh, so if you have uh, any specific question for Dr. Su, you could share it with him. And then there is uh, a resource here for further guidance. Uh, I think it's really useful if you could go through the Cochrane Handbook for uh, systematic reviews. So then we have uh, a webinar coming up next month. And uh, it's also within our series. We have the first session it's like uh, a basics of systematic reviews for beginners. And uh, I have shared the link in the chat box already. Nafisa, could you reshare the link again?
Yeah, I've shared link in the chat box. Uh, so you could start signing them for, for the webinar. Uh, the last thing we would like to share with you, yes. is, uh, last thing we'd like to share with you is that this is a certificate uh, event. I mean, uh, all our events, uh, we give certificate of attendance. So if you had attended the first session and this session, you get a certificate of attendance. But then we, but then you have to complete a quiz before getting the certificate. I mean, you have to pass a quiz before getting the certificate. So we'll be sharing uh, the link to the quiz through our uh, emails, and that will be uh, within a week time. And once you complete the quizzes, you can get a certificate of attendance. So I don't know if there is any other question we have not treated concerning the event. Yes, we'll be sharing. Uh, we had already shared the resource for last week. That's the, the resources for last week. That's the video and the slides. I definitely will be sharing Dr. Su's video and uh, slides through our emails. So that's uh, all for now, Dr. Esu. Could you give us your final words, please? Thank you. Well, it's been great uh, interacting with you all today, and uh, I must commend Fortune and his team for the good work they are doing. So I'll urge you to keep it up. And um, to the participants, take advantage of this opportunity to network and get help to advance the reviews you might be working on at the moment. So from my end, uh, I wish you the best for the rest of the day and in all your endeavors with systematic reviews. Over. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just to chip in again, uh, we have a, a Google group community and we have a WhatsApp group community. So in the beginning, we had seen lots of introductions and lots of call for collaborators. Uh, so we're wondering if you could take this to our WhatsApp community group or our Google community group. So if you have, uh, if you're leading a systematic review and you are looking for collaborators, you could share it. Uh, you could share this in our WhatsApp community group or in our Google community group. So Nafisa will be sharing the link to the WhatsApp community groups and the Google groups as well. And also, we are planning a mentorship cohort later this year. And in the cohort, we will be working with teams that have a registered systematic review protocol. And we will be trying, we'll be supporting these teams to develop this protocol into systematic reviews. So it's really important that you follow us on our social media platforms because we have lots and lots of events coming up. And one of them is the mentorship program. And the other one that you probably find very useful is like a hands-on systematic review practical. So we are taking us through a complete systematic review practical. And these are some of the programs that we have coming up. So you could follow us on our social media platforms. Nafisa, is there any other thing you have missed out? Is there something you would like to share with us? Oh, no, thank you. Thank you very much for your attendance. And maybe the last spot that I love every time is just to take uh, picture so we can share it on our website. Okay, fantastic. So could you please turn on your camera and uh, we'll take the photos. Thank you. Nafisa, please you could help with the photos. Hi, just a moment. You can open your camera. Okay, I'm taking the first screenshot. Second one. All right, I'm taking the second and third. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.